welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on medication assisted treatment in tribal communities. My name is Rebecca Horschief. I'm Osage and I am the program coordinator for the National American Indian Court Judges Association. I'll be moderating today. We want this to be an interactive experience, so please feel free to ask questions throughout and to make use of the chat feature. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, for today's webinar, we have um, presenters from the National American Indian and Alaska Native um, uh, Addiction Training and Technical uh, Assistance Center. So these are treatment experts who are coming to us to talk about medication-assisted treatment. Um, and for today's webinar, they're going to do presentation, and then we will have time for um, the audience to ask the experts any questions that you might have about medication-assisted treatment and how it works. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean Bear the first from the Native American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Treatment uh, Training and Technical Assistance Center. Sean. Oh, Sean, are you there? Hey, hello. <clears throat> um, again, my name is Sean Bear. Um, with me is Ana Helena Skinstead. We work with the National American Indian Alaska Native ATTC. Okay, so we are National Native American Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, supported by a grant from SAMHSA and CSAT. Can you uh, forward that uh, uh, slide for us? Because we can't. I don't think it's on here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, here it is. Oh, yeah, okay, there it is. Okay, remembering that uh, the kind of content of this publication does not necessarily reflect the views and policies of SAMHSA or HHS. Okay, so when working with natives, we need to remember to also to use affirming language that inspires hope and advances recovery. Remember that language matters. Uh, from, from older practices, working with natives, you had the understanding that words have a power, in a sense, an energy, a things that can go out and affect others. So the way that we speak to others, in a, in a sense, has a way of influencing people, whether it's with anger or kindness or, or love or something like that. It has an energy that may affect others. So remember to be kind of people first. Um, Native American communities have and continue to experience many traumas, and therefore use the words that reflect strength rather than deficits. Respect rather than disrespect becomes very important. Um, I want to not spend a lot of time on this, but alert you to the ATTC network, which is this year celebrating its 25th anniversary. And here you see the ATTC centers, regional centers, fall of the um, HHS region. So there are 10 regional centers and three national centers, one national coordinating center that facilitates interactions between all of us, and then one center focused on Hispanic Latino issues. And the reason why I bring this up is that I think it is important for tribal judges and people working in tribal courts to access the network websites to look at who to contact if you have specific questions that you want to raise and all of us will focus on opiate addiction these days because we have a serious opiate uh, issue across the country. Oh. I, I don't know what's happening.
what we wanted to bring up here was that we have not an overlapping map with the um, IHS regionals centers, which is important to know, especially because when it comes to opiate addiction, um, IHS provides some services and also financial support to treat uh, and use medication-assisted treatment for opiate addiction. I do not know what is going on because we only see a blank slide at the moment. Um, I'm wondering if you can assist well, us a little. Yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and move the slides. Um, okay. um, in order for you to see them, I think you might have to reboot. But if you have a hard copy in front of you, um, yes. then I think you can just use those. Okay. And um, and yeah. I can move them so they're on the screen. So right now what I have um, is the importance of knowing where the 12 Indian Health Service regions are located. Is that the correct slide? Yes, and then I'd like you to um, go to the next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. And what I'd like, the reason why we brought this up is that we have, SAMHSA has decided to really support the ATTC network and we have several new centers that would be important for people working in tribal courts. And one of the centers is the Tribal Affairs Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, which means we are focusing on mental health issues. And um, then we are also focusing on um, prevention technology transfer. And the one that really is relevant for the um, opiate epidemic is that we are providing tribal technical assistance to 137 tribal communities that has received tribal opiate response grants. So the TOR recipients are the target or the goals for us when it comes to helping them implement um, opiate response. Okay, so then we get into the opioids is <clears throat> talking about different or important aspects of opioid addiction. So yes. <clears throat> many times with uh, MAT, um, it's referred to as drug or prescription misuse. We must take into a consideration that drug addiction can, can happen and come to many backgrounds of education and ethnicity. There has been concerns for those who have access to medications such as nurses, pharmacists, and doctors, and so forth. So those who have a close access to it may also develop issues from that access. Mm -hmm. Intolerance. Intolerance um, comes when substances are repeatedly used over time. It may take a higher doses to achieve the same effect. Many substances that produce tolerance also have potential to become addictive. And let me add to that, uh, tolerance for opiates may very often uh, develop very fast and the reason is opiate may, opiates may not be the first drug that people have engaged in abusing and we often talk about cross tolerance so if you have a serious alcohol problem uh, your tolerance to opiates will develop and start from a higher level and develop quicker. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that can be very dangerous with withdrawals and um, the tolerance is because if you consider this as in a s similar to lifting weights. So many times you have people who lift weights 
and maybe they're building for a while they're getting stronger they're able to lift all this weight and then they take a long break maybe something happens in their life where they can't lift again so maybe months later or a year later or so what happens is that they tend to want to go straight to the weight they had before just like in substances but that is when a time they can be either seriously hurt or just with substances they can have an overdose and oftentimes fatalities happen when someone relapses have been sober and away from opiates for a long time and then as Sean says tries to use the same amount and that can result in fatality mm -hmm. very serious and this kind of brings up the topic with uh, challenges using behavioral health therapies is that some people may believe you can use only behavioral health therapy with those who have opioid dependence but what happens is is that because of the chemical changes that have been going on with, with substances um, the chemistry is altered so some like uh, depressants when people get off of these with withdrawal then it it shoots up in a sense so they may become very anxious very a lot of anxiety their heart palpitations there it can be very dangerous with those who are taking um, an upper when they come down through withdrawal it's the opposite effect that's something we need to remember with these so coupling that with medication assisted treatment it works best in combination with these two and because withdrawal from opiates are so unpleasant not as dangerous as alcohol withdrawal but very unpleasant there is a lot of tendencies to relapse so a medication assisted treatment starting with methadone way back when is the treatment of choice in addition to behavioral health therapies and uh, some of us will say that it's unethical to ask any opioid a dependent person to go cold turkey and not have medication assisted treatment treatment on board but the best results is always in combination with behavioral health treatment next slide please So again, different groups report addiction to pain, um, such as the elderly, adolescents. So with adolescents, usually at times there may have parents who have um, medications on hand. So some of these youth may actually take that medication um, without knowledge of what these do. And we have discovered that adolescents often start going to their parents medicine cabinets mm -hmm. and one thing that I also want to address is the issue of how we saw an increase in prescription use and specifically for pain uh, in the early 2000s and we have a long-term effect that unfortunately is across the world with forgetting that yes these are very effective painkillers but they are also very addictive and what we didn't add in those years was the best practice which is when somebody a dentist a nurse practitioner is able to prescribe um, it's very important to educate the patient before the patient goes out of the office that these medications need to be tapered off and don't uh, sort of encourage that the client get three re refills after a root canal. You don't need three refills of oxycodone. Uh, you need to take the top of the pain and then 
discuss with the patient what do you do when the pain is gone. There are different ways of using a me medication assisted treatment. And one thing that I really want to highlight is that psychopharmacology, psychopharma therapy um, and withdrawal from opiates, there are times when people need inpatient treatment, medical supervision. And that's very often um, in populations that are elderly uh, to because they have other um, medical conditions, they may be on other medications, and because of the very challenging physiological change that happens when you stop taking opiates, that may be the time when the patients need to be under um, medical supervision to not get a catastrophe uh, on your hand. And outpatient treatment is something that is very important to do uh, if a person has a stable home and um, structured atmosphere around them. Um, they can withdraw or be uh, taken over into medication-assisted treatments uh, in an outpatient setting. That being said, doing starting maintenance treatment before the weekend is something that most people do not recommend because then you are leaving the patient to his or her own devices and they feel that this is not re they don't have the same effect so then that's often times when they combined it with things they find on the street and we have possibly a fatality at our hand. So outpatient treatment should really start when the patient can have fairly close supervision and still work at home. Mm -hmm. And maintenance treatment um, can be, um, you can use different types. Um, buprenorphine is a maintenance therapy that has been developed consistently over time the last 20 years. This is a therapy that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to the uh, physician's office to get um, the medication once a day. Um, you can have a patient get a prescription and come regularly back to the physician. However, methadone may be something that give, is given daily and needs very thorough supervision. These are also medications that we think are very important to consider when someone is pregnant. It's really dangerous to expect a pregnant woman to go to cold turkey. It's better for the fetus that there is a maintenance dose and a very clear clinical supervision of her during the pregnancy. Yes, also with this is that within treatment, normally what they do is to have access to AA or NA. Um, it's very common within the outpatient treatment. But we need to also remember that not all Native Americans, Alaska Natives, will want to use AA or NA. Sometimes they may use the American Indian adapted AA or talking circles. Sometimes these are more acceptable to Natives. Um, remember that cultural factors have gained popularity by the realization that Many evidence-based practices were not studies explicitly with native populations. So, and we also we need to remember that because tribes vary in tradition, practices, beliefs, and healing, they are not always cross-cultural. Um, many must be in mind that with so many tribes, 
tribal languages, traditions, beliefs, and practices, there also can be a great diversity among the tribes, as well as those within urban areas, and whether they are considered tra traditional, bicultural, or assimilated. And one thing, Sean, you and I um, may have forgotten to talk about is that one of the uh, medication-assisted treatments that are used and can be recommended is Vivitrol, which is a monthly shot. Um, it will give people the opportunity to uh, not have to go back so often, but mm -hmm. it's a painful shot, so some tribes have uh, really indicated that they don't really like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so differences between MAT maintenance and emergency interventions. So methadone, remember that it's a full agonist. So they get the full opioid effect. For opioid use disorder treatment and withdrawal, should be careful when intended to be used with some respiratory issues or liver disease um, or have low levels of physical dependence. Um, also remember that some people can be allergic to these. Uh, buprenorphine, it's a partial agonist for opioid use disorder treatment and withdrawal. Should be very careful also when considering use with those with severe liver, liver impairment or hepatitis C. Now Trexone and um, antagonists for opioid treatment and relapse prevention of opioids after detoxification. Remember so what some of the tribes are doing are using some of these others first and then moving on to naltrexone. Um, it also works with alcohol. Should be careful of considered use with those who are presently physically dependent because it can cause a withdrawal action if they have not been through detox. So we get into different types of utilization for emergency interventions. Um, naloxone normally has required professional training for use of overdose by hospital professionals, paramedics, and other professionals um, for use um, for those who suffer from opioid overdose. When we get into Narcan, um, it's a little bit different because it's designed to be used with medical training. A nasal spray, oh, it's not, it's designed to be used without medical training. It's a nasal spray, um, pre-filled. They also have uh, um, injections, um, but it's not recommended to use for those who are allergic to naloxone hydrochloride or infants under four weeks of age, as this can be life-threatening. So remember that there can be those who are allergic to some of these medications, so they need to be able to have some other kind of medication that might be available to them. And this is only emergencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, when people are in an emergency situation and overdosing, these medications are very important to save lives, but it doesn't cure any opiate addiction, and that needs to be followed up afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next yep. slide. Um, as I said earlier, psychopharmacotherapy for opiate use disorders works best in combination with psychosocial treatment. And when I'm talking about psychosocial treatments, I'm thinking specifically about motivational interviewing, um, which is a approach that works very well with natives, has been developed in uh, collaboration with some native tribes. But what I felt as a clinician was that I would use motivational interviewing to actually get clients motivated to go into treatment, including uh, pharmacotherapy, um, other things that they needed to sort out in their life to be able to be successful. 
cognitive behavioral therapy is um, some what adapted culturally, but not completely. But it's much more built on skill building. So it requires a very close relationship to the culture that this person is living in. And, um, but it is something that tribal communities have really um, wanted us to work with them on and especially help them adapt culturally. Community reinforcement approach is a more holistic approach and it's something that we sort of intuitively think about when we think about treatment and it includes uh, a lot of different things. Job training if somebody needs that, education if somebody needs to complete their uh, education, family therapy and most importantly increased cultural and community involvement and I just want to refer back to a little study we did in a community correction community and the native participants in this intensive outpatient was very much more successful if they had followed the advice of engaging with their elders, connecting with the community, increase their involvement in the culture. That created a meaning of their life and also a direction of where they wanted to go. Okay, so we go to the next slide, how courts can support those in opioid recovery. So remember that <clears throat> uh, safety and detoxification, detoxification is required. Uh, majority of jails do not provide medications for detoxification of opioids. Those that do may have not have followed the evidence-based practices there are ethical considerations to public health. Um, in the past, opioid withdrawal had generally been thought of as, as very unpleasant, but it has been evidently has become evidently clear that it can be life-threatening, especially among overdose cases. Um, safety and detoxification is required. Um, withdrawal symptoms include factors that can be dangerous if not taken seriously. Fever sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, may result in dehydration and heart failure. It is, is essential that clinical health management is available for appropriate medical attention. So, majority of jails do not provide medications for detoxification of opioids. Denying medications and medication Assisted treatment has been a long-standing practice within jails, which violates prohibitions on discrimination based on American Disabilities Act, Rehabilitation Act, as they both cover substance use disorders. Um, we need to remember that um, many are not aware of it as evidence-based practices in jails. Um, it's not their profession with treatment or prevention. So a lot of those things may not be covered. There are ethical considerations in public health, such as um, cruel and unusual punishment when they are detoxing or withdrawing from the drug. Harm reduction refers to policies and practices aimed at reducing harm, which is a strong commitment utilized within public health and human rights. Okay, next slide. Barriers and possible solutions to barrier barriers and possible possible solutions to barriers with MAT. So, looking at the financial aspect, um, there has been uh, monies or grant something funding to get certain medications, but not always for all. And like we had said before, with some people can be allergic to certain medications, so they need to be able to have an alternative for those. We need to remember that there are, there has been effectiveness of pharmacotherapies. Um, 
but we also need medications um, beyond that, with beyond withdrawal that are intended for treatment. Methadone, as previously stated, there are precautions utilizing methadone with certain patients, but also for longer periods of time. Um, licensure, licensure requirements have been a barrier for a while for tribal communities when trying to utilize certain pharmacotherapies, but just recently they had passed a new practice where some of those medications they were could not get before and based upon licensure requirements have been changed. So please check your um, states and regulations. So we get into cultural factors of this is when you remember that when applying evidence based treatments with ethnic minorities outside those they were in design for um, they mainly come from these studies mainly come from Caucasians in a sense and not explicitly including aspects of American Indian or Alaska Native cultures with past studies approximately 60% of counselors were found to be non-native Caucasian females um, others being Caucasian males and other races of either male or female that were non-native. Um, very little were from the native tribes. And many times they had no formal cultural training or knowledge of the tribes they had been helping. There's been a stronger movement towards adopting mandatory Native American, Alaskan Native cultural competency courses among some tribes in order to properly care for the tribal members. These may include education of traditional practices, customs, and beliefs that will be confronted within the care of the members of the tribe. Although many tribes utilize such practices as a purification ceremony or sweat lodge, um, this is not cross-tribal. There are some tribes who do not practice this at all. This is also considered to be a ceremony, which requires years of training in order to be able to lead one, which is more culturally accepted, acceptably run by natives within the tribe. So what they have seen before with those who are taking Suboxone is that around any country, it has been evident that the rate of recovery was slower. Um, they needed to be able to include more time for reducing medication in order for a successful recovery. At this point, there has been no studies developed in regards of opioid pharmacotherapy in regards to ethnic differences. As you've seen before, like with alcohol, there has been um, information about uh, Asian countries and stuff like that, the way they process alcohol. And it's very similar with the native tribal members. So I think Annalena had also talked about injections. Um, injections for opioid pharmacotherapy have um, retention challenges as it requires a patient to be opioid free. Yet this may also be used after detoxing, detoxification has been completed. But since they are only needed to be injected possibly once a month, this may assist ensuring the medication is being administered correctly and, of course, requires less appointments and time for oral medications. So important factors or information that tribal courts uh, may need to understand when using um, is that Remembering that there's no evidence-based practice of American Indian or Alaska Native tribal members in all cases. Although there is no evidence-based practice within American Indian and Alaska Natives, there have been results that suggest there's a cultural adapted evidence-based treatment. Um, evidence-based treatments may provide um, success of treatment. There's been concern that medication-assisted treatment does not match well with Native American traditions, beliefs, and healing approaches. 
Um, this is something that is needed within the different tribes in order that they can find that information themselves. It's very important that um, the different tribes are able to help with those kind of studies, help with those kind of treatments in order to, to find a way, in order to help many natives across the country with this. So, are there any questions or? Sean, can you um, see the chat? Um, we have some questions that have come in. Okay. Um, if you can't see the chat, I can read them to you. Uh, so we have um, Eleanor Beal asking about how to find facilities, particularly in the state of California, um, for Native people. Um, does the network have kind of a list of facilities, or how would people go about finding something? Well, I do know that there are IHS facilities out that way already. There are some different organizations that help with natives out that way. Um, I would probably check online to see about the IHS. And from there, you should be able to look for either behavior health or substance abuse treatment centers within that area. They should be able to have information on that on the web page itself. OK, that sounds like a good resource. Um, and then she also asks, um, if there's someone who was heavily dosing on morphine, um, Norco, pain patches, among other things, um, how long does the treatment take? And I think this is a question really about um, medication-assisted treatment altogether. Is, is this something that somebody is doing for a lifetime? I mean, what is really kind of the recommended um, approach here? I think it can vary, I believe. Um, like I said before, with many of the treatments they had um, for opioid pharmacotherapy, they were kind of going by one certain uh, detoxification practice in a sense, but it wasn't um, culturally adapted. And that is when they began, they were using Suboxone. So many of the tribes had difficulty with Suboxone, and by the time they got done with Suboxone, on treatment um, or detoxification, they were already addicted to Suboxone. So they realized that it's the withdrawal process and detoxification um, was taking longer. So they need to be able to extend that practice, in a sense, to withdraw from that drug, in a sense, and then move it um, to another medication so they could go to treatment. So sort of a step-down process then? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, for how long they should stay in treatment? Um, I mean, in many cases, I know before, um, what they really suggest is, was that the whole length of treatment was a year to two years. Um, but that also included either um, detoxification, residential, um, outpatient, um, aftercare, in order to go through maintenance, in a sense, for them to have a successful um, recovery. I think there are some studies out there that within many treatment centers, I think at least 90 days was um, was very beneficial. Anything under 90 days had a higher rate of um, going back to the drug, a relapse. Um, those, the longer it was above 90 days, the more success they had. So one of the questions I received um, before the webinar was about using medication with with kids, with juveniles. Um, do you know of any kind of research about using it with young people? And are there any different guidelines for using medication with, with people under the age of 18, or even really probably 18 to 21 year olds? I mean, I don't know where the physiological cutoff would be there. 
No, I'm not sure either, but but one thing to consider is when using it with youth, we need to also remember, just like with other substances, is that the earlier that somebody begins taking a substance, the more likely that you can have problems later on, just like with the marijuana or methamphetamines. Um, the earlier onset and heavier use tended to have a higher um, percentage of those might have mental health disorders later on. Um, remembering that they talk a lot about the brain not being fully developed until around 25 years of age. But it, we also need to be able to take in consideration that our organs and stuff like that are not fully developed when we are youth. So going as we are maturing, those also um, mature as well because sometimes the organs are not mm, mature enough to be able to handle certain kind of medications or drugs or alcohol itself. So we need to be able to really kind of work with prevention efforts in order to help to stop the use before during those ages but throughout the lifetime. I mean it's something that Many natives long ago had not mm, had certain kind of issues with drugs or alcohol because it wasn't part of our our culture. Thank you. I think that was really a good point to think about um, how uh, the Suboxone or the, any of those um, medications that you would use for the treatment could affect developing not just brain but organs. Um, I think that's an interesting dimension to consider. Um, and then the next question um, that came in was about um, how to handle this in rural areas. You guys touched a little bit on it, talking about the shots, um, but there, and it sounded like there are versions of medication assisted treatment that can happen without regular trips to the doctor's office? Is that what I heard you say earlier? More so for like outpatient or definitely after detoxification. Um, if you look at um, native communities, some of them are urban areas. Some of them are actually rural. So we run into some of the same kind of situations as those in rural areas do because many of the tribal lands are rural itself. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? You can just type those into chat. All right, um, if there are no other questions, then um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rebecca, to wrap up. I have, um, I think, kind of two slides here that I'm bringing up, um, just to remind folks about um, all the stuff that uh, you do at NYJA. So, Rebecca, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ann Skinstad and Sean Baer for that very interesting and informative presentation. Before we conclude, I just want to make, I just want to take a moment to talk about NYJA and our work in tribal communities. As some of you already know, NYJA is a tribal justice professional organization whose goal is to build tribal court capacity. We do a pretty broad range of work for tribal communities, including training and technical assistance to support tribal courts. We're also a TA provider for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, CTAS Purpose Area 3 grantees. Part of our support for tribal courts is our annual conference that was held last month in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This year we featured topics that highlighted ways in which tribes utilize their courts to strengthen, restore, and protect their communities, and will continue to offer cutting edge training for judges and court clerks. Another part of our work is the Tribal Access to Justice Innovation website. This website allows us to highlight and share different programs in tribal communities. 
If you know of a promising program, let us know about it. And if it's not already highlighted on our website, we can go ahead and share it. That website is tribaljustice.org. And again, our goal with it is to learn about emerging practices and share that information as many tribes are addressing common challenges. And that concludes our webinar. My email address is Rebecca, R-E-B-E-K-A-H, at Nija, N-A-I-C-J-A, dot org, if anyone has any questions or TA requests. Otherwise, thank you to our presenters for your presentation and NCJ, FCJ for hosting, and thank you everyone for joining us today. All right, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we do record these webinars, and they will be available um, on the website, and if you'd like to receive a copy, you can email us um, to ask for that. Uh, there will be a short survey that um, will appear uh, when the meeting closes. Um, we just want to hear from you about how um, we can improve our webinars and uh, future topics you'd like to know more about. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>